When it comes to diet, things can get complicated, especially in the context of whether a diet may have anti-aging potential. Diet includes not only composition, but abundance and timing. And if you think about it, even a specific diet can have much variation in each of these different variables, depending on your lifestyle and where the food you eat was sourced. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video, with the help of an interesting recent review article that you should totally check out if you can, I will explain the different diets, including intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets, ketogenic diets, time-restricted feeding and protein restriction, and see what are the most and least promising of these as anti-aging diets, at least based on the current information. And then we'll look at what is it about these diets that have led them to being described as anti-aging, what's the evidence and what are the remaining questions. And as well, I will include some common misconceptions about diets, so you'll want to hang around until then. So just a little terminology first before we start. What exactly do we mean by anti-aging here? Well here we're referring to anti-aging as delaying or reversing biological aging by targeting established molecular mechanisms of aging. So that's what we mean. Now in terms of the scientific research into anti-aging diets, it could probably be best traced back to the early 1900s when rodent studies examined the impact of caloric restriction. Caloric restriction here refers to the reduction in total calories by 20-50% to without malnutrition. Reducing the amount of food given to lab-bred rats delayed their development, but it increased their adult lifespan. And as you may already know, caloric restriction, or dietary restriction, has also been shown to extend lifespan in many different model organisms. But what about humans? Well, one data set includes the cleverly named Comprehensive Assessment of Long-Term Effects of Reducing Intake of Energy, Calorie. This was a series of clinical trials involving calorie restriction, here 25%, in both normal and overweight adults ranging from a few months to two years. What they observed was a variety of clinical biomarkers, including decreased weight, enhanced insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance, and improvements in cardiometabolic risk factors. However, as we'll see later, it's not quite plain sailing for caloric restriction, but for now let's move on to the other diets. So next up are keto diets. These diets involve a restriction in carbohydrates and are higher in fats to induce ketosis. Simply put, this is when you don't burn carbohydrates to generate energy, but instead break down fats into ketones and use them as an energy source. Support for this diet and anti-aging comes from two 2017 papers you can see here. This second paper had mice either in a 12% carbohydrate diet or a 1% carbohydrate diet from 12 months of age. In both, there was an increase in median lifespan along with improvements in memory and motor function. Then we have intermittent fasting and fasting mimicking diets. Now, I have separate videos on these diets which you can find the link to in the description, so I only briefly mention them here. And so, fasting mimicking diets, FMDs, were coined by Dr. Fulter Longo as an alternative intervention to caloric restriction, mainly to avoid the risk of malnourishment. And it involves a reduced caloric diet, but only for a short period every few months. And it's thought to work in a similar vein to both caloric restriction and keto diets by inducing ketosis. However, one of the interesting things with these intermittent fasting approaches is that there's a combination of having the fasting periods with a period of refeeding, which at least in rodent models seems to show that the refeeding can induce stem cell activation. However, a recent study showed that alternate day fasting over three weeks in healthy people was less effective than having an isocaloric daily energy restriction, and it showed no benefits for measures of metabolic regulation or cardiovascular health. However, most of these studies in humans are really lacking long-term analyses at the moment. And then there is time-restricted feeding, which, as suggested by the name, is when you can eat every day, just within a specified time window. Not only has this been shown to improve metabolic parameters in mice, such as glucose and insulin homeostasis, but it also promotes and maintains intrinsic circadian rhythms. One of the challenges, though, with these studies in mice, as with the other intermittent strategies, is ensuring that the mice eat equivalent amounts of food to the control mice, and in the case of time-restricted feeding, that they don't eat all the food at once, but throughout the time window. As discussed in this review, Although there is some promising data from the mouse studies, human data is less clear, partly due to sparsity 
and also because it might depend on when the eating window was, for example morning versus evening. And lastly, there are diets low in protein. There's evidence from rodent studies to support lifespan increase, however in rats, protein restriction resulted in a 15% increased median lifespan, whilst rats that underwent caloric restriction had 50% increase. However, in support, another study has shown that a low-protein to carbohydrate ratio also resulted in a longer lifespan. So here, health was optimised when protein was replaced with carbohydrates. However, the same study showed that mice with greater median lifespan actually had relatively high protein. And so, given that human analyses have also shown that over the age of 65, reducing protein intake was associated with higher mortality, the picture is clearly incomplete. Part of this may come from protein quality, that is, the amino acids present that make up the protein. There are 20 different amino acids that can be used to make proteins. And so the reason I mention this is because separate studies have shown that reducing just specific amino acids, notably branch-chain amino acids, have been shown to increase lifespan and delay age-related frailty in mice and flies. So how do all these diets compare? Well, to bring together the information we've covered so far, Take a look at this table from the review. The table summarises lifespan effects in studies in rodents, with the number of arrows indicating the relative robustness and consistency of reported effects. You can pause and take the time to read these sections, but ultimately it seems to show so far that low-calorie interventions are superior to isocaloric diets. The thing is, though, I am not a mouse, and neither are you. Hopefully. And the other thing you have to consider is that these model organisms are kept consistently on a diet, whilst for us there will be occasions where we modify our diet and change our eating patterns. So extrapolating from mouse data is unsurprisingly not the easiest thing to do. Another interesting aspect to point out is the how are these diets supposed to be working. We've already mentioned ketosis, but another signalling pathway important to mediating many if not all of these diet interventions is mTOR signalling. mTOR signalling can be activated by sensing amino acids within a cell. And as you can see in this diagram, these different diet interventions are thought to reduce mTOR signalling and thereby aid in the activation of repair pathways such as autophagy, enhance mitochondrial function, improve stem cell function, and inhibition of protein synthesis and senescence-associated inflammation. And this is also the bit where I remind you that rapamycin, which inhibits mTOR, is often referred to as a caloric restriction mimetic, as it's ultimately acting through a similar pathway. Albeit with diet, as it's also got things like ketosis going on, these are by no means exactly the same mechanism. Now, before you hear my verdict and future work ideas, I thought it'd be good to include some of the fact from fiction that's also included in this review. Firstly, that caloric restriction always works. This isn't quite the case, and although we don't necessarily understand why they haven't always worked, it seems likely that it's dependent on sex, genetic background, level of restriction, and other unidentified variables. A second statement is individual macronutrients are good or bad for ageing. Firstly, the evidence is still unclear regarding this, but more importantly, we still need protein, fats, and carbohydrates to live, so I don't think you should consider any of them alone being bad. And then lastly, anti-ageing diets are known to slow ageing in people. Well, no, there isn't any strong evidence to support this in humans at the moment, and not even in model organisms such as mice. So clearly questions remain, but generally it seems eating less and reducing mTOR activation seems currently the most likely anti-aging diet. But clearly important questions remain. One really important factor to understand is how genetic and environmental variation modify the diet response, especially in understudied populations. This also goes beyond the surface level of like food allergies, which should already tell you that there can't be one universal anti-aging diet, but it enters the realm of precision nutrition, the idea that each of us will ultimately have a diet that is best for us. For example, as written in this article, there is a very real likelihood that any given caloric restriction-like diet could enhance longevity in some people while shortening lifespan in others. And the second important point It's in the context of environmental challenges, for example, viruses and flus, as there are concerns that dietary restriction may put you at risk of having a weaker immune system. And the fact I have to use words like may further demonstrates that research in these areas, in terms of human studies, is really lacking. 
To address these issues, the ideal experiment would be to just randomise thousands of people to these different diets for multiple decades. However, this is very impractical and expensive and also probably unethical. So we have to use more observational studies and and these include co-founding factors such as wealth, social status, general interest in health, as well as genetics. And so it's very hard to distinguish cause and effect. And so whilst I'm still probably an advocate for eating earlier in the day, even if the data is still inconclusive, evidently not overeating and being mindful about reducing protein and sugar intake seems like the most reasonable take home from the data. And so to end, I will still the quote from the review, Future research directed at clarifying the underlying mechanisms involved in eliciting the longevity-promoting response to caloric restriction and how this differs amongst individuals should one day help us to realise a true precision jury science approach. So with that, I hope this video has given some clarification about these different diets, but also highlighted the areas where we still need to do much more research. So with that, I want to say thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.